If you have your Bible with you, we're going to ask you to turn to the book of Ephesians chapter 5. Excuse me, Ephesians chapter 3. Chapter 3 of Ephesians, you know, sometimes we discover things by accident. And when we discover something by accident, we don't always recognize the significance. There was a man one time uh, said that uh, he had found an old Bible in his attic, sold it at a garage sale. And somebody was asking him about that. He said, well, that old Bible was, you know, printed by Guten somebody. And, and so the person talked to him said, Me, you mean you had a Gutenberg Bible? I mean, collectors say that a complete Gutenberg Bible be worth between $25 and $30 million. He said, oh, no, not this one. Had a bunch of graffiti in it, a bunch of, I mean, some kid named Martin Luther had written a bunch of notes in it. <laughs> But since you're not yet feeling me like I need you to, can I give you an experiential exegesis of accidental discoveries? Because sometimes we discover things by accident. We don't know the significance of what we found. And I'm afraid that it will be that way for us today. So first off, notice if you will, that accidental discoveries can reveal to us our past. Time Magazine reported on uh, a, a couple who was hiking in the Ty, uh, uh, Tyrolean Alps, and they, and they were a German couple, and they uh, were walking along, and they found what looked like a doll's head sticking out of the ice. Uh, and on further inspection, they found it was actually a human skull. It looked like it had a surface wound. So they went back to the, uh, uh, back to the uh, base camp, and they uh, called the police who came in to investigate what appeared to possibly be a homicide. It was not until they uh, called in the director of the Innsbruck Institute for Prehistory that they found out that that was the oldest human ever found virtually intact. It was the body of a man 5,000 years old, Neolithic trader. And his remains are one of the most sensational scientific discoveries of the century. So it reveals to us our past. Then secondly, notice if you will, on the other hand, sometimes accidental discoveries give us perspective. Thomas Wheeler, former CEO of Massachusetts Mutual Life Insurance, was driving along the highway with his wife and the gas gauge got low and so he pulled off at the exit. The only gas station there was some run down, broken down old place all ahead was one gas pump. So he got out, he told the attendant to pump him some gas. He went around to walk around the station just to stretch his legs. When he got back, he noticed his wife and the gas station attendant in an, in an animated conversation. So as they pulled away, he asked her, did, did you know who that guy was? She said, well, yeah, uh, we went to high school together. As a matter of fact, I dated him for a while. And Wheeler smiled and said, well, you're lucky that I came along. Otherwise, you'd be the wife of a broke-down gas station attendant. She just smiled at him, said, sweetie, if I had married him, he would be the CEO and you would be the gas station attendant. <laughs> what she gave him was perspective. And then third, third, accidental discoveries show us significance. Because once upon a time, there was a man named Jed. Poor mountaineer, barely kept his family fed. And then one day, he was shooting at some food, and up to the ground came a bubbling crude. Now, he didn't immediately sense the significance of, of that fact, but first thing you know, old Jed's a millionaire. Kinfolk said, Jed, move away from there. Said, California is the place you ought to be. So they loaded up the truck, and, and it showed him the significance. And so Jed Clampett gets us into our thesis for today's study. We're in need of the Bible to help us make sense of what we are in God's purpose and where we are at in eternity. And that's Paul's mission in the epistle that he pens to the church at Ephesus. You know, you know, he spent the most time at Ephesus of any place in his life and ministry. Three years he stayed at Ephesus, not because he liked Ephesus, not even because he liked Ephesian people particularly, because he says he fought with them like wild beasts when he was at Ephesus. He stayed there three years because they needed him. That is how long they needed him. Living in a thoroughly Romanized Greek city, they needed to know their role in God's eternal purpose. So Paul writes to remind them of the mystery. And the mystery is this. Here's our first point for study. Despite what is going on at any given moment in time, it is creating a cosmic consequence, an eternal effect, even though it cannot be seen. 
So in Ephesians chapter 3, Paul presses pause long enough to pin the words that will encourage us in God's mission. So thank God you showed up this Super Sunday, because God has a word of destiny, not just for those who got baptized today, but also for you. And this is important because here's our second point for study. If all you can see is your immediate situation, then your circumstances control you and your happiness is based on happenings. So you're excited when circumstances are favorable, but you're miserable, critical, and complaining whenever they are not. Our happiness is based on happenstance. But as you open up yourself to God's eternal purpose, you get God's eternal perspective. And God's eternal perspective makes your happiness centered on the one who, who is making the happenings happen. So Paul tells the Ephesian saints, God's purpose is larger, it's greater, it is grander than what you ever imagined. We put this on your handout sheet because God's eternal purpose is to glorify himself by Jesus Christ through his body, which is the church. And in the passage we've tagged to teach today, Paul says this is more extensive than anything you could imagine because of its cosmic dimension. And on this Super Sunday, not Super Sunday 48, Super Sunday 22, because our church was founded 21 years ago, Super Sunday, 1993. We ought to all be encouraged to look further, dream bigger, rise higher, and push harder by focusing our attention on four critical realities of God's eternal purpose. Anybody want to hear this? Just say, get done before game time, Alan. <laughs> Okay, I will, because Paul wants us to understand something big is happening with us in this church. And the first thing has to do with God's sovereignty. Let the whole church say sovereignty. Okay, watch. Back up all the way to verse 1, Ephesians 3. For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, word. Stop. Because when Paul opens this letter in chapter 1, he introduces himself as an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. But here in chapter 3, he calls himself a prisoner of Jesus Christ. Because at this point, he had been incarcerated two years in Caesarea, three years in Rome and en route. He spent more time in jail than Justin Bieber or Lil Wayne. And although he was arrested on Jewish charges, he did not consider himself a prisoner of the Jews. And even though he was imprisoned under Roman authority, he did not consider himself a prisoner of Rome. Paul understood God's sovereignty. So he saw himself as a prisoner of Christ, brought, bought with a price, and given the special assignment of announcing the good news of the gospel to slaves, to soldiers, and even to Caesar's household. He understood that whenever he functioned in God's eternal purpose, then whatever he did, wherever he did it, Christ was in total control. And without the Lord's consent, he was not subject to the politics, the power, the punishment of any person or principality. So he did not panic over his situation because he discovered God's sovereignty. Now let me open a window on that word because the frigid waters around Greenland, there are countless icebergs, some are large, some are, some are small, but if you observe them carefully, you notice that sometimes small ice flows move in one direction and the bigger ones move in another direction. And that may seem confusing initially, but the explanation is really simple. Surface winds drive the small icebergs, but ocean currents drive the big icebergs. I don't see why you're not getting this. Because the next time you face a trial... Just remember, there are two forces operating in you, your life. There are surface winds and there are ocean currents. The gusts and the gales represent everything distressing and unpredictable and changing. But out of sight, underneath the scene, ocean currents represent the sure movement of the sovereignty of God, the deep flow of his unchanging love, working up underneath the surface of your life to achieve God's eternal purpose. So Paul understood his life was under divine control. He was in protective custody. Nothing can or will happen that God does not permit. That does not mean we have no part to play. That doesn't mean we have no responsibility. But it does, it does not mean we resign ourselves to blind fate. But here's what it does mean. Because the first critical reality is God's sovereignty. But the second has to do with God's providence. Let the whole church say providence. And then look at verse 7. 
whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God and given unto me by the effectual working of his power. What this text teaches is God's providence as eyes. It's not blind fate. Because after you have done all that you can, it sees that you've done all you can, and then God con continues to work his will by his word after you've done what you can. So no matter what goes down, no matter how it goes down, even if you don't understand it, as long as God permitted it, you can flow with it. You can survive. You can come up out of it because it's, God, it's part of God's plan to produce something for himself in eternity through your life. Let me open a window on that word because there are many businesses that use an inventory system called JIT. JIT or just in time. And rather than storing up large quantities of expensive items and supplies, this, this strategy calls for businesses to obtain raw material only when they are actually needed for production. That is the definition of providence. God has reserved in the future what you're going to need when you get there. But if you never get going in God's purpose, you never get the effective working of the power of God's grace in your life. Need I remind you of Romans 8, 28. And we know all things work together for good to, to them that love God and to them who are the called according to his purpose. You may not see right now how things fit. You may not know right now how things, why things happen. You may not understand right now all that's going down, but God can see the picture even before you connect the dots because God uses a JIT method. He shows us what we need to see when we need to see it. So God moves to supply us as we serve him. God, God guides us where we need as we follow him. God gives us what we need as we need to have it because my God is just in time. God moves just in time. God rescues just in time. God delivers just in time. Don't I have a witness today? God didn't come when I wanted, but he always comes on time. Where's Dottie Peoples when you need her? See, here's our third point for study. God's providence will provide you with peace if you understand God's providence because providence is the amazing awareness that everything that happens when we are operating according to God's purpose comes to us according to God's plan. God's promise always supplies God's purpose because it's stored up in advance for when you get there. So nothing just happens in the life of a person of faith. If you're a believer by being born again, then that is not accidental or coincidental, that is providential. You may not see how it fits or understand why it happens, but you can trust in God's sovereignty, you can trust in God's providence, and third, third, the third critical reality, you can trust in God's mystery. Let the whole church say mystery. Paul is wanting us to recognize something big is happening here has to do with God's eternal purpose, and God has a surprise. Watch, verse 3, Ephesians 3, verse 3. How that by, by revelation, God made known unto me the mystery. As I wrote a four in a few words, which I think he's referring to Romans chapter uh, 16. I wrote a four in a few words, whereby when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known. This is the definition of a mystery. It is something that in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. And here is that mystery, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. What a surprise! The Messiah of the Jews, <coughs> excuse me, takes new covenant promises and makes them available to us Gentiles when we believe the gospel. When we believe the good news that Jesus died for our sins, then we are all made part of the same body in order to complete an eternal purpose for God. Paul says he's surprised in verse 8, that unto me who am less than the least of all saints is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God. Now that's crazy. Because a mystery in the Bible is not something currently hidden or undiscovered. It's a surprise that's now been revealed. 
A New Testament mystery is, is a truth not uncovered in the Old Testament, but now revealed to us in the Bible. And so the mystery of the Messiah is this surprise that through the gospel, Gentiles are heirs together with Israel and members together in one body. Now let me take a teaching moment right here. Verse 2 tells us, this dispensation is an administration of grace. A dispensation is the method by which God is dispensing eternal life, saving man from his sins in any given age. In the Old Testament, it was through sacrifices at the temple. But in the New Testament, it is by trusting in Jesus and his sacrifice on the cross because that is what those Old Testament sacrifices were picturing. So check this. Paul becomes the manager of something that belongs to God. He sets he sets out for us an economy of grace. But while this surprise was revealed through Paul, verse 3, the dispensing of grace is given to every believer, verse 2. And we are to make all men understand this mystery, verse 9. So Paul points out how this plan of God surprises us because God hid it in himself, verse 9, until he got ready to reveal it. The church as the body of Christ was not foreseen in the Old Testament. Paul says, God let me in on the secret. I got to unwrap the paper and open the box. I don't deserve it, but God helped me to do it. And when I think about the depth of God's grace and the extent of God's mercy, I recognize it's not just for me. But in the final analysis, the last critical reality is God's solution. And we see a manifestation of the magnificent mystery of God. But then, then Paul takes us a little deeper. Look at verse 10. To the intent that now, unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places, might be known by the church, God has put you and me on display to teach something to angels and devils. God puts this church on display to teach heaven and hell about wisdom in Jesus Christ so that God can glorify himself. See, the church is a university for angels and every member is a professor of theology. Now that's crazy because that means whatever happens to us goes far beyond us. And God intends to use the events of your life to create an HD, 3D, 4K display for the entire universe to see. We are giving lessons to an angelic audience all the time. You say, well, Alan, what are we teaching them? You're asking good questions today. Because for the angelic, we're giving them a reason to praise. And for the demonic, we're giving them a reason to panic. Hello, somebody. That's what this is. See, watch, verse 10, verse 10. To the intent that now, under the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. So can I take another further before I let you go today? Verses 10 and 11, Paul says, God has arranged things so that this church and our amazing diversity will display the diverse, multifaceted wisdom of God. God uses all of us together to display all the hues and all the varieties of God's wisdom to a waiting and a watching cosmic realm. So once God revealed his secret, Paul says, it surprised me. Because check this. Let me hit you with this definition. The mystery of the church means that God undoes the division that he instituted in Genesis chapter 10. In Ephesians chapter 3. I think God chooses these poetic adjectives because there's a reason that we don't all look the same. There's a reason we don't all think the same. There is a reason we don't all vote the same. There's a reason we have different tastes and different cultures. It is because, and this is our fourth, fourth point for study, God is using our unique diversity to paint a colorful masterpiece that cannot be duplicated anywhere else in the universe. So let me take a teaching moment right here because Paul now starts to slip into the cosmic dimension of God's eternal purpose. And God's eternal purpose is to unite in one body all saved believers for the purpose of making a statement 
to angelic and demonic principalities and powers who have been watching the drama of redemption unfold on this planet. You know what that means? That means we are heaven's reality show. And everybody is watching. So the church is, is not just God's surprise to Old Testament saints. This church is God's surprise to the angels. This church and what we do is God's surprise to the demons and to the devil. And most Christians today do not even realize what a surprise they are. That's because we now have a completed revelation in the Bible. We're able to read back into the Old Testament. We're able to take the anti-types in the New Testament and read their reality back into the Old Testament types and shadows. The, the Old Testament tabernacle, its furnishings, its sacrifices, we are able to see the Savior in the shadows because of what the New Testament teaches us. But all of those things were designed to teach us about our eternal purpose so that the manifold wisdom of God in the drama of redemption could be displayed to a waiting cosmos of spiritual beings. They could marvel at His wisdom as they praise Him for His grace. So when you come to this church every Sunday... You better recognize. You better even redneck and eyes. Since you are God's reality show for the universe, that, that nothing can dissuade or discourage or deflect you because you understand something big is happening here. Something historical is happening here. Something radical is taking place here. Something eternal is uncovered here. God's purpose is so much bigger than me. God's purpose is so much longer than my life while I'm alive. The blessing is I get to be resurrected and become part of God's eternal plan. So I hope you get this before we go today. This is a, this is a Super Sunday because it's our 21st anniversary. This is a Super Sunday because we baptized people into a local body that is doing something unique that will affect all of eternity. Something big is happening at this church, bigger than our personal agenda, bigger than anything we can imagine. That is why, for the last 18 months, God has been doing things above what we could ask or think, because the purpose He has for us to participate in is bigger than we could ever imagine. And don't ask me why other churches don't get this. All I know is, and I put this on your handout, I think it's on the back side, that our vision, our goal, our mission for 2014 is to glorify God by Jesus Christ through His body, the church, as we preach the gospel to the world. And our prayer emphasis is, Lord, increase my love, because the greatest thing about this church is the opportunity for you to love. And God intends to use us as a demonstration of the wisdom of God to the entire universe and use our love for one another as proof of the power of the gospel to your family, to this community, and to the world. So as we struggle with our issues, as we battle with our problems, as we navigate our nightmares, as we deal with our dilemmas, as we fight spiritual warfare, the entire universe is taking notes. What an amazing work of God. That means a lot of what happens to you is not just about you. Check this, my God is green. God is green because he never wastes anything. Not even the tiniest tear falls outside of his purpose. And that means the decision that you make today before you leave to get saved or to get baptized if you are saved. I mean, you can get baptized this next service. Just, just come up here to the front, let us know. As long as you're born again, we'll, we'll baptize you. Or to become a member here if you are already saved and baptized someplace else. Or to get discipled or consecrate yourself to the mission or go on a missions trip or go, uh, go to the uh, marriage maintenance conference. Whatever decision you need to make today, if you make it, it destroys the dreams and the intentions that the devil had for you. And it puts you right into God's eternal plan. A plan from which you can trust God, God's promises. Promises for which you can know God's power. Power with which you can be strengthened with might to overcome sin and win lost souls to the Savior. Don't give in to grumbling. Don't get nailed by negativity. 
I know the kids are crying. I know the bills are due. I know the boss is grumpy. I know that gas is expensive. I know the weather got worse. I know our politicians are crazy. I know the nations are warring. I know security is shaking and the times are uncertain. But you got to remember, something bigger is happening here. And from here, you get to be a part of that. Every head bowed, every eye closed, every Christian, please pray.